Hounicon. 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 You're listening to Hounicon Podcast, highlighting citizen Potawatomi Nation issues, members, and more. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. Just search Hounicon Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Paige Willett. This episode includes a look at new international business prospects with CPN, a story of Thanksgiving donations from employees, a visit to a tribal member's bootmaking workshop, and a recipe for traditional corn pancakes. Citizen Potawatomi Nation is in the process of building and operating its own industrial park, giving business partners and tenants the unique opportunity to be an international business with the Native American sovereign nation. It recently opened an electrical substation able to power the entire park. CPN Director of Economic Development and Planning Jim Collard and I discussed the park's business potential. The Iron Horse Industrial Park is the only active foreign trade zone on Native American trust land. Foreign trade zones are a very unique feature of the U.S. commercial system in that it provides a location for uh, tariff deferment and tariff elimination in certain cases. So that's a huge tax savings right there. In addition, you save a lot of time in terms of the Customs and Border Protection processing because that uh, activity is taking place within Iron Horse rather than waiting out in the ocean for your tanker to finally get into the port, be they Long Beach or wherever it is. And then finally, there's a provision called merchan- merchandise processing fees that allow uh, for reduction of how often or a combination of how often the, those fees are assessed. And so there's another big savings there. That's one piece of Iron Horse. In addition, the tribe is tax exempt and we can monetize those savings to the individual customers whereby they will not end up having not having to pay property and sales taxes on their materials. So those are gigantic savings. It's the best tax package in the country. The best tax package in the country. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hands down. Aside from monetary reasons, why else should businesses choose to work with Iron Horse to build their industrial businesses? Well, we are located in the center of the United States on a Class 1 railroad with redundancy to a short-line operator as well. We're very close to Oklahoma City, uh, and we're not very far from Dallas. We like to joke with people that we consider Dallas to be our most successful suburb. And, of course, they chuckle at first, and then they get thinking about it, and they realize, actually, we are very close to the uh, Dallas markets. But it also, we're very... very close to Kansas City. Uh, Denver's not that far away. Houston, by the way, is our port of ent- our primary port of entry. But, of course, we get products from everywhere, you know, Long Beach, L.A., and the East Coast, and even out of the Great Lakes as well. So we have the rail infrastructure. We are within uh, 10 miles of Interstate 40, within 30 minutes of I-35, and, of course, an international airport's not very far away as well. So we're ideally located in the center of the United States. Ideally everywhere. (laughs) Pretty much, yeah, that's right. And then we have the the advantage of a a low-cost business environment being located in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is a very business-friendly state, and uh, we have a workforce that's wonderful that is low union, a very small union presence, and so our wage rates are very competitive. So apart from businesses who want to do business with Iron Horse, how does it expand the tribe's economic development? Well, it diversifies the base, of course. You know, the tribe has, uh, last time I checked, was 22 separate businesses. Uh, The casinos are the big ones, of course. Uh, Iron Horse provides manufacturing. Manufacturing has a huge economic multiplier associated with it. Uh, so it allows tribal and non-tribal members to get uh, jobs that are higher paying than, say, retail or uh, other industries, manufacturing being the highest. So that's the biggest thing. It diversifies the tribal economy. And with businesses coming in internationally. Oh, yes, absolutely. We have a global footprint. 
Um, and uh, we uh, are well known internationally. Our first company is Canadian. Right. Uh, they should be in production in the spring. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, recruiting ca- uh, Canadian companies. We love Canada. Our clo- the two closest allies on the planet. Uh, we have close friends in Canada. And we're also looking at our other allies, of course, uh, Great Britain, uh, Japan, uh, Taiwan we're talking to as well, uh, Germany. Uh, sometimes France pops up. We'd love to work with France. So, I mean, a lot of different places all over oh, sure. Europe yeah. and into Asia. And you bet, yeah. I'm part of, uh, I'm on the board of directors for several internationally oriented uh, groups. I'm on the board of directors for the International Economic Council, Economic Development Council, IEDC. Uh, I'm on the board of directors and past chair of the Oklahoma Governor's International Team. And I'm on the executive committee of a group called the International Intertribal Trade and Investment Organization. Uh, this is a joint, started off as a joint U.S.-Canadian effort, now has expanded to Australia and to New Zealand. And we're looking at a few other countries as well. And what we're doing is creating mechanisms whereby indigenous people can trade uh, directly across international boundaries utilizing the foreign trade zone uh, framework. Uh, We have uh, minted this uh, approach in a sense. Uh, We have an established expertise in terms of how to do this. And uh, we're uh, very excited about uh, the contacts. You were speaking about the first company being Canadian. That is ProPipe LLC. How did that business relationship, how did that connection sort of evolve? Where did that start? Sure, it started actually at a breakfast. Um, I was invited to have breakfast as part of the uh, Offshore Technology Conference in Houston. And uh, a gentleman representing ProPipe from Canada uh, came up to me, and we began a conversation, and one thing led to the other, and now we have ProPipe. So it was the French that put us in touch with the Canadians that resulted in our first company. Why did they choose Iron Horse? Because of the reasons I've already articulated. Uh, We're in the center of the country. Uh, They are oral patch oriented, which makes it even more important, location more important for them. The fact that we monetized our tax saving, our uh, taxing ability uh, as savings for the customers and so on. Just makes too much sense. Oh, surely. It's a real easy decision for the company uh, decision makers to, to make once they see the entire package. We are well known in some circles. And we're trying to become well-known in others. So what are some of the precautions that your office uh, is taking place to ensure that Iron Horse meets current tribal environmental standards? We are talking about, you know, uh, production and industrial businesses. Well, we've turned down uh, several companies uh, that were recommended to us. And we uh, are very sensitive to the fact that uh, the tribal lineage, really, from time immemorial, emphasizes care of the environment and taking the long-term picture. So we uh, do we do not really recruit companies that have environmental challenges. We're also very tuned in to the principles of the circular economy. And the circular economy is akin to uh, industrial ecology, This says essentially uh, utilizing the same resources over and over again and utilizing renewable uh, energy as far as possible. Ideally, what uh, we're trying to recruit are batches of companies that use each other's waste products as part of their production processes. That would be our perfect picture. Uh, Easy said, tough to do, but that uh, is always in front of us, uh, always on our horizon. So that way, when one company is done with something, the next company is just picking it up. That's right. So, again, the, the fund, fundamental principle of circular economy is to utilize the resources indefinitely. You don't utilize them once or twice and then throw them away, landfill them, or put them in a stream. You just keep using utilizing them over and over and over again. How does that idea of the circular economy play into how Iron Horse looks to protect long-term assets as far as the land that, that the park is, is physically built on goes? Well, it, I mean, it goes hand in hand. If we're not polluting the soil, then the soil will last indefinitely. Uh, that's the whole idea behind it. Uh, we will be installing uh, solar panels and 
uh, certainly um, the our electrical supply uh, provider it has a huge uh, renewable energy component to them. Uh, so every sis- every decision we make is based with environmental sustainability in mind. How will the recent McGirt ruling impact someone interested perhaps in doing business with Iron Horse and with CPN? Shouldn't have an impact one way or the other. Um, we monitor it every day, of course, but uh, or almost every day. But I don't think right now it's going to have much of an impact. Um, the tribe operates uh, under the purview of Congress. Tribes do not report to state or local governments on trust land, which, of course, Iron Horse is. The Murgart ruling, uh, while a U.S. Supreme Court ruling, uh, really is not going to impact our commerce within Iron Horse. We just don't see any ramifications. How will the larger community and Pottawatomie County that CPN is part of geographically benefit from businesses locating at Iron Horse? Well, it starts at the individual level. I mean, the majority of the CPN employees are non-tribal members, and that will carry over to Iron Horse as well. Uh, There's also the multiplier effect, meaning um, the multiplier concept says a particular new job into into the area has value relative to other types of jobs. So retail, a new retail job does not add a lot of economic activity because they pay low and the resources, the inputs into creating that job are pretty low. Juxtapose that to the other end of the spectrum, manufacturing jobs have high economic impacts, have high multipliers because they pay more, and generally the production inputs are more expensive uh, as well. And all that creates money that is circulated over and over again in the economy. So in terms of the economic development game, manufacturing is really the highest priority because it's the biggest bang for the buck. What are the next steps for Iron Horse's growth? Continuing to market the park um, and continuing our outreach efforts internationally. So we'll just continue the effort. And uh, the park started off at 400 acres. It's at 700 acres now. This has been a tremendous team effort, obviously, and the uh, leadership and the vision provided by Chairman Barrett, and that's what started the whole thing. And it, it's that kind of uh, champion um, that, uh, and that kind of uh, uh, support and encouragement and vision provided by Chairman Barrett has made Iron Horse possible. It wouldn't exist without him. Uh, we'll, we'll see what the future holds, but it's pretty bright. Learn more about Iron Horse Industrial Park at ironhorsecpn.com or email Jim Collard at jcollard at potawatomi.org. Citizen Potawatomi Nation tribal member Terry Don Peltier began his business Top Hand Boots located near Prague, Oklahoma, four years ago. He loves cowboy boots, a combination of versatility, strength, and rugged beauty. The Peltier family descendants collection spans both his closet and the workshop in his barn. Stepping inside, the scent is undeniable. Uh, well, it's just that smell of boot leather. Um, there might be a little hint of glue adhesive, but uh, adhesive is you know part of the boot making process. Um, there's all kinds of leathers here. There's uh, there's bison. There's water buffalo. There's calf skin. There's goat skin. There's kid skin. Nothing is pre-manufactured, and all starts out as a few pieces of leather cut, molded, and stitched together. Peltier remains dedicated to his craft after learning the basics six years ago. Now a skilled bootmaker, he hand makes footwear for friends, family, and clients. My enjoyment is whenever I get finished with a boot and the customer comes in and they pop that boot on and the smile on their face when it fits them like a glove, that right there makes it all worthwhile. Peltier spent more than 26 years in the oil industry before its downturn in 2015. He has always enjoyed working with his hands and chose to learn how to make cowboy boots, a physical process that requires precision and patience. First, Peltier found somewhere to be an apprentice. Boots always piqued my interest. I had a lot of boots in my closet. They weren't custom boots, uh, but always liked boots. And so I started looking at maybe I could do something with boots and then... 
I started calling around and then I found a guy down in St. Joe, Texas, which is uh, Carl Chapel, which he just recently passed away about a month ago. And I sat with him for two weeks and just knew enough to be dangerous coming out of that. He continued to learn from others and developed his own style and way of working. Peltier also built a workshop and spent two years traveling throughout the southwestern United States, collecting equipment from retired bootmakers. The refurbished parts fill his 14 by 40 foot workspace. A lot of this stuff comes from like South Texas, New Mexico, Kansas, all over the southern part of the United States. So uh, it's usually from old bootmakers that are retiring. They don't have no one to pass it on to, so they're getting rid of it. And some of the stuff will end up in the scrap heap. There's not very many people are left around to work on this stuff. So you have to almost be your own mechanic to learn how to work on this stuff. Although he began building his shop only four years ago, Peltier has made significant changes. Well, I've actually had to expand. That used to be the back wall. And I started accumulating more machines, more machines. I've run out of room, so I had to cut a hole in that, build that on back there just to make that kind of like my sewing room where I stitch all my tops and stuff. I'd love to be like downtown Prague in an old building, but this suits me real good. Peltier considers a good pair of boots an essential piece of equipment for a cowboy, and the fit often determines their utility. He takes most of the stretch out of the leather, so there is little to no breaking in a pair from his shop. If you got a good fit boot, you can stand all day long in them. They don't hurt your feet. Like some of your working cowboys, they want a, a tough boot, but also something that they can clean up and go out to eat in or go dancing in, what have you. So... Uh, I have some leathers that that can do, that can be tough, and they can also clean them up and be a good dress boot too. He uses somewhat unconventional equipment to ensure a perfect fit, including recording and tracing clients' feet in a foot and a half long old accounting journal. Clients receive five different measurements on their feet before Peltier builds a pair of custom boots. And there's some guys that take not as many measurements and there's guys that take a lot more than I do. It just depends on how you was taught. You get five bootmakers in a room, they're gonna all gonna do it different. It's on how that was passed, the knowledge was passed down to them. He spends up to two hours with the client designing and measuring for their one-of-a-kind pair. Peltier knows they enjoy participating in the process and picking out their leather, stitching, heel height, and more. Some people's specifications cover everything down to the color of the thread, but he likes it most when they let him be creative. The more, you know, variations, more custom you can do to it that someone can choose, that's what makes, makes it for the person is they can make it their own. Peltier and other bootmakers from across Oklahoma meet up a couple of times a year. They number fewer than 10, with some of them forced into retirement by arthritis and other health complications. The two that taught Peltier their methods and designs no longer practice their craft. Peltier also believes his artistic ability comes from men on the Potawatomi side of his family, which adds pride to his work. His grandfather Raymond Peltier was chairman of the tribe in 1974 and enjoyed sketching and drawing. Peltier hopes to teach the next generation to pass on pieces of all the men he's learned from. My favorite part is probably putting all the pieces together. So once I get through like stitching these tops and then... A pair of top hand boots bottom, starts at $600 and takes Peltier approximately 40 hours to complete. He also requires a six month work period, although he often completes them sooner. Find top hand boots on Facebook at Top Hand Boots. The coronavirus pandemic made everything look and feel different throughout the last year, including the holidays. However, employees of Citizen Potawatomi Nation's workforce development and social services were still determined to provide as many delicious Thanksgiving meals as possible. The staff expanded the number of families they served with their annual Thanksgiving food basket drive from 185 to 225.
Social Services Counselor Shelley Watson called the program that has been running for over 20 years a glimpse of hope at the holidays. She led the drive for the first time in 2020 along with Homemaker Services Safe and Stable Families Counselor Kim Ko. Assistant Director Margaret Zintek challenged them to make it bigger than ever before. Last year we served 185 families and this year we're able to serve 225 um, Margaret really pushed an increase because of COVID, and there could be so many families that are desperately in need of this. Co and Watson began working with the tribe at the same time in 2018, and they both remember their first experience boxing and handing out Thanksgiving baskets to families. Watson said it fed their desire to lead the drive on their own. I think we just really looked forward to the opportunity to work together. Um, we feel like it's a worthwhile effort for sure. So we've kind of bonded together as we've grown here. And so we just looked at it as a challenge that, you know, we would like to be involved in. And so that's, that's why we're doing it. They collected food donations from 11 departments throughout CPN's enterprises and offices, aiming to provide not only Thanksgiving dinner, but also breakfast and another meal for each family. Some departments filled baskets on their own, while others purchased bulk items to distribute among all the boxes. A few enterprises encouraged the public to participate by placing a basket where customers and visitors could contribute, including the CPN Cultural Heritage Center. Co. said workforce development and social services collected 2,742 pounds of food from the 11 departments that participated. They handed out baskets on November 19th and 20th. For me, it was that, seeing the community come together and serve these people and see families so excited, some of them in tears because they're getting this. To get to be a part of that is a huge, huge deal. The department that donated the most pounds per employee won a gift card. However, Watson believes it meant more than that to everyone participating. I've had tribal employees call me and say, hey, you know, God just really placed it on my heart this year to donate in bulk, you know, how can I help? So people do it out of the goodness of their heart, but we do have some competitive people here yeah. also, <laughs> and they want the bragging rights. So more power to them, you know. As a tribal member and descendant of the Curley family, Watson started working for CPN a couple of years ago, but never knew about all of the services the nation offered, especially those available with workforce development and social services. She has grown by learning and providing to others as part of her job. With that first year, it's like there would be something brought up that, oh, we do this. So, you know, everybody kind of helps out. And then we do this and then we do this. There's so much that we do here. Um, I would have never guessed. In 2020, she and co continued the department's partnership with other organizations and businesses in the larger community, such as Shawnee Mill, which helped feed 40 more families than usual. Watson hopes to expand the drive further. This is our first year, so next year, you know, we'll learn from the mistakes that we made and, and maybe reach out to more people um, to help. Maybe we can serve more families. Visit cpn.news backslash workforce for details on CPN workforce development and social services programs. It's time for learning language, when CPN Language Department joins us to teach vocabulary, songs, stories, and more. Today, language aide Reagan Marcy teaches how to make four-ingredient corn pancakes, or pugna, in Potawatomi. Pugna. Pugna is a nabogia, flat corn pancake. Mbenkik means pancake. <laughs> um, it's made with niao, four ingredients, and they can be eaten uh, wishpokwet, which means sweet or savory. Although wishpokwet is the best way, obviously. <laughs> um, netam, first, um, search for a yawan, a tool to grate the mdamen, the corn. Um, off of the mdam the uh, the corn cob, and into a bawaskiak nagen, which means deep bowl. Uh, I use a cheese grater, a cheese grater for quick results, um, but you can use whatever you have, like a blender, anything. Um, add to the batter gold bananich, which means one handful of napane, 
of flour, um, a dash of the cardboard gorgkin, which means baking powder, and salt to your liking. Or you can do no salt, or you can add sugar. It's like, it's awesome. It's a blank canvas. Heat up a kadi, a skillet, with bimede of your choice, with an oil of your choice. Namin badan, I like the taste of bamedewish, olive oil. Cool fact about bamedewish, uh, the name literally translates to oil plant. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. But if you like savory, that is a good choice. And if you like sweet, the magmeshi bakan, uh, coconut and vegetable bamede oil is better for like wishbukwet sweet recipes. You can find a video for making pugna at cpn.news backslash pugna. That's P-E-G-N-A. Reagan went over the cooking vocabulary for us again and threw in a few more holiday food terms for this time of year. The cardboard gorgkin. The cardboard gorgkin means baking powder. Mdamen. Mdamen means corn. Napane means flour. Bemede means oil. Netam means first. Pugna means traditional flat corn pancake. Uh, Nabogia means flat. Bankeek means pancake. Niao means four. Wishpokwet means sweet. Ndowabdan means to search. Yawin means a tool. Mdamin means corn. Mdamanatak means a corn cob, and it literally translates to like corn stick. Bawaskiaknagen means deep bowl. Chis means cheese. Got bananech, got bananech, that means one handful. Kadi means skillet. Namin badan, namin badan means I like the taste of something. And uh, the N at the beginning of the word indicates it's something I like. If I say gumen badan, that would mean you like it. Um, Bemede wish means olive oil. The magmeshi bakan means coconut. The magmeshi bakan literally translates to monkey nut, so it's pretty cute. Um, here's a little list of other holiday Wisnowin food terms. Um, Mseze wias means turkey meat. Wabgon means pumpkin. Wisnowin means food. Kwesmin means squash. Mbede means butter. I love that word. I think it's so cute. Mbede. Mishimen bito dishkwegen. Mishimen bito dishkwegen means apple pie. Um, bito jishkwegen literally translates to in between layers. So it can also be used for like sandwich or lasagna. Aha, chimigwech! For more information and opportunities with language, including self-paced classes, visit cpn.news backslash language. You can find an online dictionary at potawatomidictionary.com, as well as videos on YouTube. There are also Potawatomi courses on the language learning app, Memorize. Hanukkah Podcast is produced and brought to you by Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Public Information Department. Our director is Jennifer Bell. Don't forget to subscribe to us on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find what you listen to. We're also on Facebook at Citizen Potawatomi Nation and on Twitter at C underscore P underscore N. Visit us on the web and find digital editions of the tribal newspaper at potawatomi.org. That's P O T A. W-A-T-O-M-I dot org. Until next time, I'm Paige Willett. Miigwech Nikanek, Bamamina. Thank you, friends. See you later.